Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Everyday Business Show. I'm your host, Tony Lontis, and today we have another amazing interview with Dr. Olivia Ong. But before I introduce you to Dr. Olivia, here's what you need to remember. If you're listening to us live on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitch, or even Twitter, just remember the notes from the show will appear when this is streamed live. If you're watching post-show, then all the information and links is not only available on TonyLontis.com, but also in the information attached to this interview. A reminder too that you can watch this interview on Binge TV Networks USA, Hero Go TV USA and on the Tony TV channel app available on all Roku, Samsung and LG uh, smart TVs across the planet. Now, Dr. Olivia Ong is the CEO of Dr. Olivia Ong, the heart centered doctor. This is the second in our show series. And before I speak to Olivia, here's what you need to know. Olivia is a compassionate leadership and resilience speaker. And her story tells, talks about how she overcome a tragic and traumatic spinal cord injury when she was a resident in 2008. So that was partway through her medical training. She had to learn to walk again with two sticks and a limp, and that took an agonizing four years. Dr. Olivia's spinal cord injury taught her a very important lesson around self-compassion and behind this she created a business and wrote a book the heart centered doctor and heart centered medicine now we're going to be talking a little bit more about this and the book during today's mm. show and dr olivia now practices full-time as a rehab and pain specialist she coaches one-on-one -on -one. she speaks she does workshops and she talks about burnout, compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma in doctors and medical practitioners. And she thinks that she needs to provide a positive legacy for our upcoming generation of doctors. Last week, we spoke extensively about the impacts on doctors of working in the medical industry. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But firstly, welcome back to the show, Dr. Olivia. Thanks again, Tony, for having me. It's a delight to get to talk to you and we were chatting just before the show. So not only has Dr. is Dr. Olivia in Christmas holiday mode, but the kids are home from school, which means that she has to get a six-year-old organized and set up so that he's happy for the next 50 minutes or so whilst we film our segment. So not only is Dr. Olivia a wife, a mother, rehab specialist and pain specialist, she's now working on a legacy to leave for young doctors. Um, before we get on with a few of my other questions, I wanted you to talk briefly this morning about your love of rehab and pain medicine because it's very close to your heart, isn't it? Yeah, it is indeed very close to my heart. So the reason why I love rehab medicine and pain medicine as well, they so much is because they focus holistically on the individual. They don't just look and focus on a certain disease and then just focus on treating it. So that's the beauty of rehabilitation medicine. And that's the purely the reason why I chose that particular specialty. I mean, I chose rehabilitation medicine way before my spinal cord yes. injury. But obviously, life, life can be ironical, and I ended up being a rehabilitation patient. And because I, I became my own textbook, it made the whole experience of w working as a rehabilitation physician so much richer, so much more meaningful. Not only I could understand where the patients are coming from, I could, yeah, I, I just totally get it. Um, and then I could Absolutely. just offer that much more support, emotional so, and mental support yeah, from a different level. I think it's a different level of understanding Great. and knowing as well yeah yeah um and your focus on on pain as well but would be incredibly helpful for your rehab patients because often there's pain involved in rehab and recovery isn't there absolutely um tony and 
pain, there is a, actually a backstory behind pain medicine. Yes. Because I actually chose that particular specialty because of what I've observed as a spinal cord injury survivor in America. So when I was doing my, inter- I, in our last episode, I talked about my intensive rehab mm-hmm. and Project Walked. Yes. And I, w- I was there for close to three years. So I got to connect with other spinal cord injury survivors. Sadly, with spinal cord injury, pain is a very common phenomenon associated mm-hmm. with, with a spinal cord injury. And it's not just one form of pain, it's different multiple? levels of pain. Yeah, multiple levels of pain. And a lot of it comes arising from the spinal cord injury itself. Yes. Be- because it's it's part of the central nervous system, like the brain and spinal cord. The, that type of pain, we call it central pain. It's really hard to treat. And the suffering is a lot more tremendous and intense. And that's what I got to witness um, as a fellow spinal cord in- injury survivor. My friends were all suffering from chronic pain. And not only that, they were self-medicating with opiate medications. Yes like drugs. Um, I mean, cannabis is legal in America. So they were it is. also taking that as well. And they were taking alcohol. And, you know, it's just not uh, pleasant to see your friends suffer like that. So I told mm. myself, you know, once I get a chance to go back to Melbourne to resume my career, I'm going to subspecialize in that. And, and that's why I eventually did. Yes. Purely because of what I had to witness visually and personally. It was very sad and very heartbreaking as a friend. And I, I promised myself that I will want to help people like my fellow spinal cord injury survivors and other neurological disabilities as well. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. With, if they have pain issues. Dr. Olivia, what are some of the things that help you and help your mm. uh, patients work through that pain? What are some of the things that you found that help the mm. most with that chronic pain management? Mm. Thankfully, I didn't get any chronic pain because uh, people are always Good. curious. Even my own patients are very curious and they ask me because I walk with sticks because they assume yes. when you walk with sticks, you are in a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. But I use it because I have an actual weakness in my leg in terms of strength. So I do need the sticks for support. Yes. But I don't have chronic pain per se. So I was pretty lucky. Uh, but not many other people with spinal cord injury. And I think one of the biggest um, thing that I've seen in the patients that have looked after chronic pain who actually went on to do really well yeah. in our pain management programs and subsequently it's you know thriving in the community is their self-acceptance um, okay. that's one of one of the three pillars of self-compassion e- eventually they have to go through a journey of self-compassion themselves like first of all they have to be aware that they are suffering a lot of them are not aware that they are even yeah. suffering mm-hmm. okay yeah okay. i think yeah and the thing and the thing with suffering it feels quite insular and isolate, isolatory yes. and quite, yeah, quite lonely. Yes. Um, and, then, and then you get quite harsh critic. You, know, you start yes. judging yourself, blaming yes. yourself for your pain and all that. Yes. So ruminating thoughts. I think if the um, patient or the individual with chronic pain eventually is aware of their suffering, that they are in pain, that they are willing to seek for help and reach out to other people for help. And also if they start to accept themselves for who they are and accept pain as it is, and then take charge of their lives rather than pain taking charge over their life. It's then, that's the, that's the transformation that I see the most in my patients um, from, from my perspective as a doctor. Yes. It's quite a journey, isn't it? So I've got Mm. um, chronic aggressive rheumatoid arthritis and Mm. the pain is like, nothing I can describe other than to say that it's like a million knives stabbing my joints. Mm. Now, it's not like that all the time. And I've actually Mm. had it long enough now that sometimes I don't notice. But if I'm cranky and cranky for a number of days, then I'll go, Mm. oh, my body's really hurting. So there's so there's actually Mm. not I've actually got to the point where there's not actually a conscious recognition until I go oh okay I've been cranky for a couple of days what's that about oh yeah body's really painful um Mm -hmm. and and you can live with it and have a wonderful life uh and it is a lot about mindset isn't it and going okay well there's not a lot I can do about this I can take loads and loads of drugs but that doesn't really solve anything uh and if I if I do these other things, like I meditate and uh, have quiet time and rest and relaxation for me works the best, uh, that helps 
just get on with life because life is fabulous and you don't want it spoiled by uh, chronic pain and there is a way to live with it and work with it and, and enjoy life. In talking about this subject, we can't, we need to quickly remember that dealing mm. with patients that have tremendous industry, uh, sorry, injuries rather, uh, trauma uh, and chronic pain has an impact on their carers, i.e. the doctors and nurses that look after them. And it's possibly linked to the workload but it's also linked to the uh, intellectual and uh, spiritual and uh, all the rest of it and it causes doctors angst and burnout and they're already very hard working so uh, how do you see this playing out which spoke a bit about this last week but how do you see this playing out in the healthcare system right at the moment Dr Olivia? Yeah so right at the moment, doctors and nurses are probably even more than ever under the pump because they do not have a choice in patients with COVID turning up at the, at the hospital doorstep. Yeah, They just have to take a few deep breaths and then just go like, and they really have, it's survival mode for all, yes. all these frontline healthcare workers. And as we alluded to in our, in our episode last week, uh, they have to wear that PPE all day as well. Yes, and it's And they have to be isolated and away. And yeah, not, and we're coming to summer in Australia, so mm -hmm. it's going to be even more uncomfortable uh, for the frontline healthcare workers from Absolutely. a you know, mass laws, hierarchies, yes. hierarchies, yes. hierarchy needs perspective. Mm. Um, it's really hard to look after yourself from a hydration and nutrition perspective when you're wearing a gear like that all day. Mm. So, um, so more than ever, they're still under that kind of uh, working, very harsh working environment. Even though that our country is relatively in freedom at the moment, outwardly well, that's what it looks like, yes. but not in the hospitals. Uh, and I, I, I'm hesitant to bring this up, but only because I've had a few conversations with. So Queensland has has done marvelously well. We haven't seen the level of uh, virus that Victoria, for instance, has had. We haven't seen the mm. impacts on the healthcare system. And uh, Queenslanders are a little uh, apathetic about the whole situation. And so there's that constant rhetoric of they're lying to you. We've got enough ICU beds. Our hospitals yeah. aren't filled, et cetera, et cetera. But that's because we live in Queensland. And we haven't had to deal with the level of, of virus and infection that, say, Victoria or even New South Wales has had to to deal with so it's a different perspective isn't it and I can well imagine that Victorian um, health care is fatigued well and truly fatigued is that your experience Olivia? Absolutely Tony um, mm -hmm. our state is the worstly affected of all the states because we've been through multiple, lockdown, multiple lockdowns and the healthcare workers are, are tired um, yes. And a lot of them are so tired and burnt out that some of them actually have left the profession, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. And if this trend is going to continue, it's just going to result in the workforce collapsing. Yeah. And that's not yeah. good for the healthcare it's not system. Good. Not but, good. Hmm. Because we're not on the other side of the pandemic. I, I know with lots of states opening up in preparation for Christmas, a lot of people are mm. thinking, oh, this is over. But it's not, is it? It, 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 there will be ongoing issues and possibly ongoing uh, upheaval in the way that we look at life and the way that we do life and impacts on mm. our uh, healthcare system and our doctors and nurses. And I think that people forget what it's like or don't understand what it's like to be constantly working so hard under so much pressure and so much stress it has a huge impact on doctors and nurses. And as you said, that's why they're leaving the healthcare profession in droves at the moment. Now, I want to switch gears and talk about your book, Heart Centeredness, mm. uh, sorry, pardon me, The Heart Centeredness of Medicine. Can you tell the audience mm. about your book, Dr. Olivia? I wrote this book, Tony, because I've just watched way too many doctors suffering from burnout and I've been there too, so I know what mm. it feels like. And my book talks a lot about heart-based tools like self-compassion, mindfulness, just you know, to help doctors manage their burnout or even recover from it. The truth is self-compassion is really 
it's a wonderful tool you know, for doctors mm. to be able to, you know, put them look after themselves and then so that they can best, you know, serve their patients and their family. And the thing is, doctors find it hard to do that because we've been so conditioned, and I'm sure nurses as well, we're conditioned to put yes. our patients first. Yes. And our working environment may not be, you know, maybe quite stressful and we have got pressure to look after a lot of patients mm. at the same time. So that's, there is basically no time to look after yourself, but self-compassion comes from within and yes. there is always time for self-compassion. I think doctors and nurses will have to realize that if they don't put themselves first, they won't be good for anybody. That, that's and that's right. the, yeah, yeah, and that's the whole reason why I wrote the book because I've just not only seen doctors suffering from mental health issues like anxiety, mm. depression, because mm. of burnout, there's been a lot of physician suicides. Mm. In fact, one doctor dies every day in America one doctor dies every day in America. Really? I'd, yeah, I that's how bad it no is. no idea. I knew that it was bad, mm. but I didn't actually realise. So, so when we think about that and conceptualise that, that's someone who has spent up to 10 years studying, learning and educating themselves so that they can look after other human beings and they're so mm. overworked, so stressed, so uh, uh, anxious that they see no other way than ending their life. That is incredibly profound to think about, that the carers are ending their life because they're not cared for. Um, yeah. I, I'm so glad that you are openly talking about these subjects, Dr Olivia, and, and I'm mm. thinking that heart-centred doctors are how we would like all of our doctors to be heart-centered what do you think mm. makes a heart-centered doctor and why are they important in our healthcare system mm. to me a heart-centered doctor I guess that's the whole reason why I named my business the heart-centered doctor will be to just be you and be uniquely you that's the whole premise of my of my work is a lot of the times when we are when we are working as doctors or nurses or healthcare professionals, we wear a certain persona, but we're yes. not truly ourselves. Yeah. And being a heart-centered doctor will be speaking from that heart, um, you know, from the heart and speaking the truth, being unapologetically you, and being sincere, being truthful, and no, you know, no fakeness or that kind of thing. Just being who you are. Yes. That, that's the that's that's the simplicity and loving yourself just as you love everyone else. Self-love, very mm. important. Absolutely. I think um, a lot of us operate from the, from the head up, but not yes. from, a heart, from the heart. So I, I, I'm encouraging or creating a movement rather of heart-centered doctors who are willing to stand up for their cause, impact the world and speaking from the heart. That's, that's essentially what my movement is all about. Yeah, yeah. Just being us, being uniquely yeah. us. Yeah. Dr. Olivia, I am, I, there's not a lot spoken about these concepts within your medical training, mm. is there? It's just, there's yeah. such focus on the scientific and mm. the body systems and, and the, um, the mountain of information that doctors need to know and understand. Do you hope in the future that, uh, heart-centeredness, self-compassion, learning to deal with burnout will become an integral part of what doctors study uh, at university? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how you mentioned that, Tony, because yes. yesterday I was having a meeting with uh, doctors from the Asia, Asia Pacific region. We're all yes. um, self-compassion teachers, mindfulness Ooh. teachers, but we're all doctors too, and nurses yes, and psychologists. Yes. 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 And, and a big part of our mission is to actually introduce self-compassion and mindfulness into the medical student curriculum and into the hospitals. And that's our core vision. So it's funny how you mentioned that because I just I had this meeting with the beautiful yes. um, healthcare yes. workers. And that's and I and yeah, we believe that this should be taught even as early as the medical student days. Absolutely. Before they go, before they burn out, like you know, when they get to the intern years, resident years, they burn out. So I want, Absolutely. I think all of us were thinking the same wavelength that yes, we, they need to, the medical students will need to know about it way back, you know, like in medical school. 
Dr. Olivia, as a medical student, you get the worst jobs when you're on clinical mm. rotation. You get treated yes. really badly. You work yeah, incredibly hard. And sometimes you're working for 24 hours straight. I mean, as from a nursing perspective, I used to watch young residents really mm. struggle. And back then, mm. I didn't, I wouldn't have known how to help them other than, you know, the normal things like, hey, have a look at this. Perhaps you want to do X, Y, Z, mm. or perhaps you want to review blah, blah, mm. blah. Um, but if we mm. actually taught that in the early years of uh, student um, placement and training, perhaps we could circumvent some of this um, fatigue and burnout. The other thing, Dr. Olivia, is mm. I could never understand why they made residents work such long hours because that's just not good for anyone. Do you see mm. any solution in the future around that idea? Do you think um ideology is shifting so that we don't do that to our student doctors yeah i think that's been a lot of attention lately about long junior doctors having longer working hours there's actually a class action in victoria Good. i'm not sure about other states Good. yeah um against um hospitals for making them work longer hours without pay so there is yes. awareness now and I, I believe hospitals are actually working quite hard to hire more staff to Good. cover more more roles i think because of it, it just it, it made it to the media and there was a, been a lot of hype about it and obviously the hospitals are like oh we better do something about it now yeah. and they are doing something about it yeah totally but, but what a way to treat um a human mm. being who is in a caring profession who exactly. is making life and death decisions about other human beings to make them work for such a long time because research suggests um, and I can't remember actual numbers mm. but you get to a certain point and your decision making really deteriorates why would we do that to our doctors and our nurses why 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 I don't understand yeah I, I believe Tony is because the people higher up or people in admin mm. don't really know what it's like to be a doctor or a nurse yeah so I've, I've, I've suggested to, I guess, hospital staff, I mean, people who are a bit yes. higher up there, yes. that perhaps they should shadow the doctors and nurses for a week and to actually see what we do. And Agreed. then create Agreed. the roster, create the working conditions. But it's because people who are planning the roster, planning the working environment have no idea what's going on in the, in the real life of a doctor or a nurse. Absolutely. Often you've got an admin level perso person doing the rosters for nursing and doctors. Mm. And my belief has always been that that's a, a health professional's role and no one should be rostering doctors other than a doctor. No one should be rostering nurses other than a nurse and any of the other things in between. I know mm. it's I know, I understand having done rosters for many, many years that it's challenging, mm. but you actually get yeah. to know your staff really well. You know that uh, your chief, uh, your senior scrub nurse has to get the children mm. to school on Wednesdays and you actually get to know their lives and what impacts mm. on their working lives. It's a much better way to do things. And I'm sure if we did the same thing with doctors, that it would improve things. Um, so switching tax again, I wanted to talk about the imposter syndrome. And it's a wonderful yes. topic in Australia because mm -hmm. uh, we also have a thing called tall poppy syndrome. So let's talk oh, yes. about the imposter syndrome, what that means from a doctor's perspective and why it's important to talk about it. Yeah. You know, imposter syndrome is something that I've been, I guess I've suffered from for many, many years. Mm. But until I truly reframe it in a certain way, it really was affecting the way I was showing up. So medicine is a very competitive um, environment. And, you know, people who get into medical school have to compete at the beginning to get in, even to get into medical school. Then after you graduate from medical school, you have to compete again for, you know, specialized registrar positions and things. So, um, and there's always that comp competitive spirit and every time you see someone who's apparently you know much more in like, your mind you know, has more achievements yeah more achievements seems to be doing much better than yourself 
you start going, oh, I don't know. Um, even though I'm doing quite well myself, it'll be Absolutely. like, Absolutely. What if they find out that I'm not even as good as that other fella, <laughs> like, or that other lady? <laughs> like, I'm just like, I don't even know anything. Like, you know, like that, yeah. that is something that constantly plagues, you know, doctors, high performing doctors. And I think it, it's ultimately from that, that, you know, sense of guilt and shame if you, you know, of something. Make a mistake um, or you don't perform well enough exactly. or, you, uh, or you miss something or, and that happens yeah. by virtue of the fact mm. that you're a human being. It's got nothing exactly. to do with the fact that you're not performing. It That's just life, isn't it? Um, we're particularly hard on ourselves here in Australia. Mm -hmm. We have uh, what's called the tall poppy syndrome. So if you yeah. rise too far above the majority of the populace, then we like to take aim at you specifically and bring you down. This is not helpful, is it? Why do you mm. think we have such a bad problem with imposter syndrome and tall poppy syndrome here in Australia? What do you think that's about? I think it's um, it's yeah. I, I can see that Australia and America are very different because I've I've yes. lived in both places. Tall poppy syndrome doesn't exist in America. It doesn't. And in fact, That's if you're successful, thing. yeah, it, it's good. And when you're successful in America, other people cheer you on as well. Mm. And I've sensed, yeah, like you said, in Australia, it's the opposite. Even in medicine, it's very clear cut. If you yes. shine too brightly, yes, other people want to tear you down, report you to the boss, or whatever. They'll try all things to bring you down. So it yes. happens. Quite, quite aggressively in medicine, unfortunately, and I'm sure it happens I've in seen corporate it. and other... I have yeah, seen it in medicine awful. where you've got a brilliant mm. young uh, registrar who is really just switched on and 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 it's quite yeah. evident because they're just, they're engaging and their knowledge is mm. amazing mm. and you see them and you perhaps see a consultant who notices this and they do the most terrible things to them, give them the worst jobs, the worst shifts. Yeah. And why they should be encouraging this bright, shining light mm. because they might be the one that discovers something that changes the world of pain medicine or rehab or cancer. Um, and mm. I think that that needs to be talked about really openly and that there needs to be processes in which young registrars and young doctors can go hey uh this behavior is not okay it's not okay to treat me mm. like that um do you see uh dr olivia that some of those things are changing are there avenues for young doctors to talk about these uh issues in their practice before they get to become specialists yeah certainly i think the younger doctor younger doctors, like the younger doctors in training, are actually more aware of this now Good. because their social media, like in my time, mm -hmm. social media is non-existent, <laughs> was non-existent. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and um, you know, they have access and they, um, they're so into self-development, personal development as well, um, these Good. young doctors. So they know how to stand up for themselves. If they see injustice, they will call it out pretty early. Um, you know, like the unsafe working hours has existed in my time and I'm oh, sure yes. it existed in my, my seniors time, yes. but we didn't talk about it because we thought that was normal. Just had and we had to, to do like, it. Just put up with it. Yes. Yeah. But yes. these young, younger ones, they're like, they, they know they're, what their rights are, their entitlements and they stand Good. up for it. Good. So we always tell, we always call them all oh, those millennials, but they actually, they're standing up for themselves. And they call them the, the millennials. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think a way of, reframing imposter syndrome is to reframe it as a very good thing yes like, imposter syndrome means that you're actually growing expanding and you're going you're reaching new levels new heights that's how I see it the moment now I feel imposter syndrome I go oh yeah I'm, I'm growing again yes. I'll, I'll take up this challenge whereas in the past I'll be scared but now it's like okay this is telling me something like yes. but I'm, I'm willing to take up that challenge I think that's, that's a good way to look at um, imposter syndrome yeah 
Absolutely, absolutely. Because it, uh, for all of us, whether we're a doctor, nurse, yes. or whatever, mm. it's always going to pop up, mm. isn't it? There's always someone doing oh, something always. that makes you go, "Oh, yeah. maybe yeah. I could do that better." Always, I. It happens to me all the time, but I'm like yeah, you, it happens on, yeah, and exactly. have learned to reframe it and go. But I love your and I love the idea that when it triggers in your mind, you go, "Oh." I'm growing again. That's that's a really powerful way to look at it, isn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And that's that's helped me a lot, especially yeah. when now I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. And entrepreneurs yes. get a lot of imposter syndrome too, yes. because there's always yes. other entrepreneurs who are like, doing oh, different I'm things. Living, I'm li- <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm living the I'm flying first class. I'm earning yes. like seven fig- figures or whatever, and I'm like, ah, oh, there's a lot of imposter syndrome going on in entrepreneurship. I was going to say it's pretty rife across um, entrepreneurship because uh, entrepreneurs, by virtue of what they do, they're striving for that bigger impact and the global reach and the the impact on people's lives. You're driven by a huge, big vision. And so Mm. you sit and you look at yourself and you think, oh, my goodness, I I should be doing that or I should have this number of followers or I should be flying first class when in fact (laughs) you're actually in the perfect place usually that you need to be. And for you, flying Mm. first class might Mm. not be a thing. You might just want to fly (laughs) business class or uh, what's upgraded economy? Um, uh, Premium economy. Yes, premium. (laughs) See? So yeah. long since I've flown that I've forgotten uh, airline terminology. Yeah, it's and been that's a while. Damn sad. <laughs> damn sad. <laughs> um, it's about recognizing that you're a unique individual and that you yeah. have unique dreams, and what success looks like to you may not be the success that you see and I think that's helpful too if you actually define success on your own terms and go yeah no I I can't be bothered with that or I or this is enough for me because for some people Mm. success is living quietly in a rural uh, home or and it's not about the big flashy cars and and all the rest of it it's about what matters to you and what uh, lights you up and it's about the impact and you can have that impact very quietly it doesn't have to be big and brash and Tony Robbins loud it can be Dr <laughs> Olivia Ong impact because that's unique and that's special um, for doctors and nurses you've started doing something really special so not only mm. have you written the book on heart-centeredness of medicine but you've also uh, been doing some coaching and speaking and workshops can you tell us how what you do for health practitioners and in particular mm. doctors and how you do this and how you fit it in to your busy life as a specialist yeah so um Thanks, Tony, for, for those um, questions. And, you know, coaching has always been something that I've actually been doing for many, many years. Mm. But for the last 10 years, I've actually mentored and coached so many, you know, doctors in training yes. throughout the hospital systems in Australia. And I've mentored many of them through their career progression and also through their burnout prevention and management. And I told myself, you know, I want to help more people, but I can't keep doing it in a hospital environment. Yeah. And doing it yeah. in a in a I guess from a business setting makes a lot of sense because I have the skill set. And yes. I'm also certified as a life and business coach myself. Yes. So I've taken, you know, like my coaching skills to a next level. And um, I'm certified in a few other areas as well, like public speaking and all that. So mm. just you know, just helping my my mentees and clients as much as I can from because you know, with um you know with their career, there's a lot of things they can face. They can face fear of speaking in public that's yeah. a big one I, uh, yeah. like doctors do fear public speaking as well <laughs> and yeah. how to actually stand up for themselves that's actually a thing that a lot of my clients come in and they just they don't, they don't set enough boundaries they don't stand mm. exactly exactly so my whole uh, my coaching program is actually catered for doctors who are 
probably they're sort of self-aware that they are having burnout and they want to mm. do something about it. So they're aware of their problem and they're aware that I can help them with the, through coaching. I guess that's why in marketing, we call it problem aware, solution aware, or whatever you want to call it. Yes. But that's, yes. that's essentially my, when clients come to me, they say, hey, you know, I know you can help me through burnout and you've, done, you've had many years of experience. Can you help me? And that's why I do. And it's, coaching is just such a magical experience because I get to see them transform, yes. you know, bit by bit. And when they finish up, they're just a lot happier, more joyful, doing, you know, impacting the world. Because all of, you know, doctors, are, we're all mission-driven people. Yeah, we all want to impact the world. You want to heal and, people you know, and stop them being sick and stop them dying and, and all the rest of it. Absolutely. Yeah. If anyone is impact-driven, it's going to be a doctor. Um, Dr. Olivia, the other thing is that people not, might not realise that you, um, by virtue of being a healthcare um, practitioner, you spend your life educating, teaching, mentoring um, from almost the get-go. It's either exactly. other health professionals, doctors and nurses, mm. nurses and doctors, your patients, your patient's family. So this actually makes wonderful sense to me. And I'm not sure why mm. we haven't had doctor, many doctor, doctor entrepreneurs before. And it's one of the reasons I was so attractive to what Dr. Olivia does because it's a powerful reiteration of using medicine in a different way. Mm. Um, one of your programs is called Burnout to Brilliance Program. Can you tell mm. us about that program, mm. what it does? Sure, uh, Tony. So my my program from Burnout to Brilliance essentially it's a four week program encompassing self compassion, just purely focusing on self compassion. And mm -hmm. self-compassion is a, is a beautiful tool. And, in, you know, it's mainly about being your own best friend. That's what it is, yes. essentially. Yes. And why is it so important? Because not only it helps to reduce stress levels, as we know, um, chronic stress, big issue in the healthcare industry. Definitely. And with chronic stress, yeah, you know, that's cortisol and that's mm -hmm. adrenaline. I will not mm -hmm. go into the, 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 the details. The your body just doesn't need excess of. Exactly. Yes. No, no. And self-compassion actually research has shown it's actually, it actually reduces the cortisol and adrenaline levels. Mm -hmm. It actually improves the parasympathetic, we call it parasympathetic nervous system. Yes. It's because when we do self-compassion practices, we actually release the oxytocin, you know, the, the hormone oxytocin. Mm -hmm. When you read stories to your kids, yes. that's the hormone that, you know, you feel a bit lovey-dovey with, yes. with your kid. Yes. Going, oh. Yeah. And you bond so much better. Um, essentially, it's that when you actually do self-compassion, like showing compassion towards yourself, you're actually releasing your own inner oxytocin, and then, and yeah, that reduces stress. Um, it's yeah. that simple, but very hard to do. Like it's it is like hard intellectually to do. very 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 simple up to understand, hard to do. I know. Uh, I had to. I didn't have any concept of self-compassion nor self-love until I actually reached my forties, and it was actually mm. after a breakdown that I had mm. was forced to look at what self-compassion and why it was important, and it's been a game changer. So if I could teach that yeah. to, if we could teach that to children so that they started mm. from very young and understood it their whole life again huge impact on humanity because you cannot give from an empty cup you can't love from a loveless environment and that starts with yourself and it's not about thinking you're better than anyone else it's just mm. about simply accepting who you are where you are in yeah. life and making sure that you're okay so that you can create that big uh, impact and uh, purpose that you want to. So for doctors, that sole purpose is usually around health and well-being, isn't it? Mm, yeah, health and well-being mainly. And a lot of doctors actually have other creative um, mm. ideas or hobbies as well. I've I've actually met many, many um, doctors who not only focus on medicine, they also have other interests. For example, like creative writing, like I've met authors like myself who are doctors yes. too, yeah. and coaches. There's actually a growing number of doctors who are training as coaches to help Good. their peers through burnout. There's a yeah. few of us now. That's more Good. than 
like let's say 10 years ago there's a lot more yes. of us now yes and yeah so that's the uh, that's the and beautiful there's thing some amazing uh, um medical uh inventors as well some of mm. the the most fascinating inventions have come from the medical field out of necessity yeah. of wanting to solve a problem that their particular patients had and they've gone on to invent something mm. or create a surgery that is life-changing so we want our our medical staff to be uh, completely aware of self-compassion because we want them to shine, don't mm. we? We want them to be brilliant because exactly. that improves the world. It improves health. It improves patient lives. It has an overall wonderful impact on the world in general. Um, so that's one of your programs. And the other program I wanted to talk about is your life transformation program. And in particular, the CIA formula. So what, what is the Life Transformation Program? Yeah, I designed this particular program, Life Transformation Program for doctors. It's Yay. my signature one-on-one -on -one program where I take them through a journey from essentially, um, you know, when they come to me, they're quite burnt out to thriving and nourish and feeling quite nourished and flourishing, basically. Yes. Um, it's a 12-week um, program where I take them through a journey of self-discovery spiritual awakening yes and yeah it's just beautiful to see and the cia formula is something that that i I've, love it um in, invented yeah it's quite obviously cia you know we yeah, think yeah, about yeah, cops, it's good. but, but <laughs> no, it's it, good. it means yeah it means compassion it means intuition yeah. it means attitude so let me just go a little bit compassion yeah, showing compassion for others and yourself that's mm -hmm. essentially what it is Mm -hmm. That's a big part of what I do in the life transformation program for doctors. Mm -hmm. Intuition, I get, I try to guide my, my clients through some intuitive exercises, which I've learned over the years to help them rely on the intuition more rather than the analytical mind all the time, I was which just gets in the way. say, how hard is it for doctors to listen to their intuitive voice versus their analytical science because they can work amazingly well together mm. so I'm actually really curious mm -hmm. from my own perspective as well how yes. you get them to tap back into that intuitive um, knowing and uh, integrate it with their analytical scientific data-based mind that uh, medical practitioners have how, how does that go yeah. So I go, I take them through some meditative practices yeah. and some intuitive exercises. Like, mm -hmm. for example, I get them to draw circles. I know it sounds really simple, but yeah. when you see, when that, when figuratively, when you see two circles, I, I, I get them to write a victim creator. It, it really like circles are, are really amazing work yes. when they see things like that. It's visually like, Oh yes, I've been living in my victim mode for a while now. So it's, and then get them to tap into what, why do you, why are you in the victim mode and then getting to them to intuitively just say as it is and not like trying to analyze it and all that so it's just a very uh, a very intu intuitive exercise to get them to take them through um and just finding out where where they're at and where where they can be i think if once they know that oh i can my intuition is a lot more powerful than i thought you can absolutely i need to learn to embrace it rather than you know, just hide it because we, we use a lot of our intuition actually in clinical medicine. Like we yes. go, hmm, maybe yes. that person has this particular yes. disease. That's yes. intuition. That's not like yes. your mind telling you, that's not your analytical mind telling you, that's your intuition going, oh, I've seen that before. Yeah, that's that one. That's that, that's that yes. disease. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, yeah. I, I, and I, I find this a wonderful conversation to have because uh, many, many years ago, if you were to yeah. say, oh, I think da-da-da-da, in the absence sometimes of, of any clinical um, yeah. uh, foundation, people look at you strange. But I'd seen it in practice. Right. A specialist go, oh, I think it might be this. And there may not be, but eventually you, they'll find out, oh, it is this. And that was from an intuition. So I, I'm excited that Doctors are talking about intuition because it is a powerful tool and a powerful mm. knowing that, oh, this is what it is. Um, and I'm so glad that you're doing that work. And what about the A, Dr. Olivia? So attitude means an open mind, a beginner's mind. 
So every experience you have with the or encounter with your patient or every um, precious moment you have with your kids, just have, have a beginner's mind. Don't take all the baggage from home, from work home. Yes. And just, yeah, every, every learning experience is a new experience. That's what it is, attitude. And I think a lot of, quite a number of doctors don't have that. They're very conservative. They're closed up. Yes, and yes. They're not willing to receive new ideas. That's what A is, is attitude, open attitude, open mind. Oh, yeah. Always learning. And that's fantastic. Gosh, Dr. Olivia, I'm so glad that you're doing this work. Um, I, I just, it seems life-changing to me from my perspective. Mm. And, and whilst I'm no longer a clinician, I just see the power in your work. So how can you work with doctors and nurses or predominantly doctors? I predominantly work with doctors, with the life transformation program for doctors. But yes. the, from burnout to brilliance, I've actually, um, I'm working with all healthcare professionals because it's so much needed oh, right now. Yeah, absolutely. Our health, yeah, our healthcare workers, from paramedics to even the technicians yes. in the yes. hospitals, the piece we call it um, personal care assistants, even yes. those um, yes. porters PCAs. who are transporting yeah pcas transporting patients here and there in the hospitals they need to mm. learn self-compassion too absolutely so it's open to all frontline healthcare workers actually all healthcare That's workers amazing. so That's getting amazing. getting quite a lot of um quite a lot of um people from all walks of life in healthcare joining this program and they enjoy it because they wow. get to see what self-compassion can do for themselves internally yeah. and externally yeah so how do healthcare practitioners connect with you what's the best way dr olivia to connect with you you've got this amazing work uh, website that has all of the programs listed out and there's clickable links and buttons to connect with you um but you're also open to um connection on social media yeah yeah, that's correct, uh, Tony. So I'm also on, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm yes. on LinkedIn a fair bit. Facebook, Instagram, these are my three main platforms. Yeah. So LinkedIn, any healthcare worker Facebook, can reach me through. Instagram. Instagram and your website yeah. is simply dralivialong.com, isn't it? It's Dr. Olivia Lee Ong.com. That's right. I forget the Lee. I'm so yeah. sorry. For anyone listening, oh, that's all right. <laughs> if you've missed that, it will absolutely be in the show notes. And if um, you're uh, watching this live, just jump onto tonylondis.com and you will see Dr. Olivia as a co host and all of her links and information about her book, where to get a book, where to connect with her, her programs, and um, how she helps healthcare. Pre- practitioners and in particular doctors because that's what you want to create as your life work that helping doctors do better get better be better and not burn out if we can save those one specialist a day in america that's passing away because they just can't take it anymore that is phenomenal in itself um, and I'm really yeah. excited to know that you work with the whole range of healthcare pro- professionals as well, but particularly excited about the work that you do with doctors because they're so important across our lives for any number of reasons. Um, Dr. Olivia, in um, our last and next show, which is happening the the week before Christmas, um, we're going to be revisiting um, lots of this information. And you've got resources as well available on your website. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, so um, on my website, there's a free resource on five t- ways to overcome imposter syndrome in female physicians. And I've also got um, the first chapter of my book that you can download for free as well. So there's mm-hmm. two uh, free resources yeah. there. But um, yeah, if you want to connect with me, I, I'm available through, um, you can just email me at yes. uh, hello at dralivialeong.com. And that's on my website as well. The email address can directly email me. Yes, and if you click on the contact form on Dr. Olivia Lee Ong's website, it will take you directly. You can also book Dr. Olivia to speak 
to your healthcare team. So if you're listening today and you're from the private or public sector um, in a hospital, I encourage you to get Dr. Olivia to speak to your team. And Olivia, you're hoping to speak in uh, all over the place in 2022, provided uh, things go <laughs> okay with COVID. But you, you, you want to do more speaking and more connecting, don't you? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I've actually been invited already to speak at the Asia Pacific Mindfulness Conference next year. And there'll be awesome. and there's lots of health there's lots of conferences that I've been invited to already. Fantastic. So I'm just meeting up with different event planners just to work things out. But you know, it's it's just been such an amazing experience. I think when you have a when you have a vision, the other similar people with similar visions are attracted are just, and off. Somehow, you go. Uh, yeah, attracted. Yeah. Exactly. And coming into my my ecosystem and you know, we're just we're just happy amazing. to just connect because Absolutely. it's really nice. Exactly. Yeah. And um, that your particularly your work around um, burnout, self compassion, mm-hmm. uh, it's powerful stuff because once you impact one person, it has a ripple mm-hmm. effect across the entire world, and we as human beings have the capacity and capability to be amazing, and just mm-hmm. helping one student doctor discover self-compassion and be self-aware could in fact lead to amazing things like incredible discoveries, doctor-led changes that help patients recover from any sort of disease process, uh, answers to the big cancer questions that we have are within our grasp and in particularly in the next 10 years I see that female entrepreneurs of which you are now Mm. one will change the face of the planet. Dr Olivia I can't Mm. wait to talk to you again next week I'm incredibly grateful that I get to chat to you each week we've had two powerful shows please join us next week for the final of the installment and all three shows will eventually be available on binge tv networks across the USA on Hero Go and also on our YouTube channel I encourage you to connect with Dr Olivia Ong um, at any stage of your for any of our healthcare pr- practitioners from patient uh, people who look after pr- patients directly right up to specialists mm. you will be glad you took the time to talk to dr olivia olivia thank you so much for your time today i'm going to let you get back to that gor- gorgeous child of yours and wishing you <laughs> an amazing day and i can't wait to speak to you next week and that my friends right, thanks, is Tony. your lot for this week <laughs>